Um, so it is an absolute pleasure to be with you. Uh, it was it was wonderful to start with everybody in that plenary and now move into specific talks. So I think Bishop Shane has set the scene uh, wonderfully. And as I understand it, um, my role is here is to unpack this theme for about 20 minutes and then we will open it for conversation. Um, and I think that might be the easiest way. Um, I often start something like this with um, some conversation, but Zoom always limits it a little bit more. But I would say that I would be very interested in our um, in the Q and A reflection afterwards to get a sense of what our interests are, what our specific questions are, because preaching is a big word, and the way each one of us might apply it could be very different. So I hope that what I'm going to give will open a conversation that might be helpful for each of us wherever we happen to be and wherever we happen uh, to minister from. Um, so uh, uh, to kickstart, this was, I'm not I'm going to reread the description that you already have seen in the profile and in the program, uh, but this is what this um, uh, session is about. I did put it up again because the part, I, the main message I would like to get across if there was one would be the last um, phrase, when and how it's not that difficult. I think preaching has become a very big word it's, it's become a very specialized word. Sometimes we think of it as very difficult. And to be honest, I do believe that those officially trained to preach, which is one of the reasons why I work in a seminary and I teach how to preach, I think it does imply uh, uh, um, work. Um, but I also think it's easier than we think in the many ways in which we're called to do it. And, and I think I do thank you for naming that, Louise, have a real passion for the fact that the word of God is so important in our lives as Christians and as Catholics and how we carry that word and we communicate that word is really important. So hopefully we can open a conversation and all of us learn a little bit about how to do that um, and the importance of doing it. So what I'm going to be trying to do in this presentation, I've, I've kind of um, named five points. So I'm going to um, name them again, just so that you're aware of where I'm going. Um, and, and I have chosen carefully just a few aspects within 20 minutes. So I'll look a little bit at foundations, Jesus, baptism, Evangelium Nunciandi, which was the document that in the preparation of this session, um, Archbishop Prowse put a lot of emphasis on. It's also one of my favorites, I have to say. So I'm a little bit biased there. Um, the Plenary Council, foundations, then why? A little bit about what I would call the sacramentality of the word. And I will unpack what that means for some of us, that might be very familiar. For others, that might be a little bit new. Uh, it's quite simple, but for me, it's just essential. It's it's the why of all of it. So I'll speak a little bit to that. Um, I'd like to speak um, a few things, a few words about the role of listening and preaching. And I'll explain why um, I want to do that when I get there. Uh, but the importance of listening, um, not, not opposed to, but as an integral part of preaching. Um, this is a bit like a lateral, it's not, well, for me, it's very central, but an underestimated space, friendship. I'd like to speak a little bit about the role of friendship and love and relationships and connectedness in preaching. And I, I was thinking of finishing with some simple tips that have helped me and that I find help others as I, as I teach how to preach or try and enable people to find their voice in preaching might be a better way to do it. The community I belong to is dedicated to prayer and ministry of the word. So I've had many, many years, both in Australia and before that in Europe and different countries, working in this space of enabling uh, people who feel called to, to love Jesus and to allow other people to know Jesus uh, feel called to this space. So I'm gathering a little arsenal of little tips. So I hope that might just be a practical help for you. But I'm sure in our Q&A, we will also find more tips that each one of us is picking up along the way. So here we go. First step, Jesus. So just foundations in this first step, okay? The testimony of Jesus. And this is one of the most important. I mean, scripture is always the foundation of what we do, right? So, so the testimony of Jesus, he does many things. We know he does many things. He heals, he loves, he suffers, he, 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 he shares, he breaks bread. But, but he, he has this expression, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also. He responds to those who are trying to bring him back. He, he worked for a day. And they want to bring him back to the same town. And he says, no, I have to go because this is why I was sent. So, there's, so Jesus is saying something really important there. He's saying, this is what I was sent to preach the good news of the kingdom of God or the reign of God, we might prefer to use some of us. But in Jesus, we have this testimony that while he did many things, he was very clear 
that he had to speak about the reign of God. So that's just one kind of element of Jesus's prophetic ministry. We could spend a whole lesson on that, but we won't. Another element and a starting point, if you want, baptism. So we know that there are different forms of preaching. We know there are different ministries of preaching. We know there's different ways of participating. But the reality is that all of us from baptism participate in the priesthood of Christ in its three dimensions, prophet, priest, and king, that we are told this at baptism, even if we are too young to realize it, or those of us who had the pleasure of being baptized later, we heard these words we share. So Lumen Gentium, which is one of the key Vatican II documents and where we rest um, our theology, our doctrine, and our faith, where we grow from, says the holy people of God shares also in Christ's prophetic office. Priests will, will share in a specific way, but as baptized, we share in this prophetic office, which means we have the right and the duty to transmit the word of God, to transmit the reality of Christ to others, to share in the mission of Christ. Um, this is perhaps best explained, I would say, in one of my favorite documents. Um, um, and, and Pope Francis has beautiful ones as well. And, and, and over time, they've been beautiful. But this is one of Paul VI. And it really is like a carta magna, like the initial foundational document on preaching or on evangelization that all the rest build on. Um, so it really is quite key in our understanding as Catholics of what preaching is about. And, and there's, there's two main points. The whole document is beautiful. I would encourage you to, to read it. Uh, but there are two main points that I would like to, to, um, to point out here. One is its, it's starting point. It states the fact that the reason for the existence of the church is mission. And so if we're not missioning, we're not doing what we were meant to do. Uh, and, it, and it says it like this. We, once, we wish to confirm once more that the task of evangelizing all people constitutes the essential mission of the church. It's a task and mission which the vast and profound changes of present day society make all the more urgent evangelizing. And this is important. This is uh, the essential part. I think the grace and vocation proper to the church, her deepest identity, she exists in order to evangelize. That is one huge statement. Now, how we understand evangelize and, and how big that is and, and how all of the mission of the church fits there, obviously, that's, that's the other question. But the fact is we exist to evangelize. Then the document goes on, and in a few numbers, it goes on to explain what the steps of evangelization are. And in, in the numbers 21 to 24, it works its way through these four steps of mission. It says the first is witness, the second is to speak, the third is to invite people into an ecclesial community. The, the fourth, and it's the litmus test of the whole thing, it ha you know that you have evangelized and missioned someone if there is a desire to reach out and go to others. Now, that desire, can I just say, can manifest itself in different ways. Some people will be enthusiastic and will be, I'm going to tell the whole world on street corners about Jesus. In others, it might manifest itself as, I wish my children knew this. I wish my grandchildren had this, but when we experience good news, somehow there is the desire that, other, that others would like to know. Now, where I'm going to focus in these, in these numbers are the first two. So I just want to show you the little part because we're going to focus on two. This workshop is about speaking and preaching. I want, to, I want you to see that the context it's in because obviously preaching isn't the only thing the church does. It's one element, but it's an essential element of the mission of the church. And I love the way here they situated after witness. So he starts by saying, Paul the sixth, that above all, the, the gospel must be proclaimed by witness. You know, so if we're not living in a way that provoke irresistible question marks in the lives and the minds and the hearts of those who see us, well, there's no point speaking because there's no openness to hear anything. And I think that's a beautiful um, starting point. Mm -hmm. We need to, our lives the way we, we live, the way we, we stand for things, need to provoke the questions, why do they live like this? Why do they live this way? So it's an initial act of evangelization when our lives provoke question marks. Why, why did she forgive me? Why, why, why did he help me in this way? All of those things that we know are our Catholic witness. But he goes on to say, Paul the sixth, the number 22, even the finest witness will prove ineffective in the long run if it is not explained justified what Peter called 
always having your answer ready for those who ask you the reason for the hope that you have, 1 Peter 3.15, and made explicit by the clear and unequivocal proclamation of the Lord Jesus. The good news proclaimed by the witness of life sooner or later has to be proclaimed by the word of life. And evangelization isn't complete until the name, the teaching, the life, the promises, the kingdom, the mystery of Jesus are proclaimed. So somehow it has to reach the word because there is no other way that people can understand who God is in Christ unless someone says it to them. That's the reality of it. Now, this is not the same as saying that the spirit isn't working in the world. Of course, the spirit is working in the world. It, we're not saying that someone who doesn't know Jesus can't somehow be touched by God's love. Of course, God has ways and means of touching. But the reality is the word of God is one of the ways, and, and, and the, the human word that names that word is one of the ways that God has wanted to act. So I'm going to move from here. Oh, and, and that's why, sorry, that's Evangelium and Siandi. Those are the other two steps I've already spoken about. That's why one of the decrees, and we started our plenary um, today with Bishop Shane telling us about the, the different processes. That's why um, one of the articles of the fifth decree um, named that, that in light of the change of circumstances of the past 20 years, the ACVC will review the provisions and guidelines it issued because there have been guidelines around speaking and preaching because this is not new. Uh, in one sense, uh, Vatican II embraced and welcomed, and that's why so many people feel called to mission in this way. But it will review what it has written for lay people to participate in a formal ministry of preaching in the Latin church, as provided for in Canon 76C of the Code of Canon Law. So I'd just like to suggest, you know, there was a lot of talk around preaching between the first and the second assembly. While I think it's essential and while I, I'm, I'm very excited about it, and I think uh, uh, we need to move forward on this, I'd also like to suggest it's not a radical change in anything. There's already a provision in canon law. It's simply the living out of our baptism. It's Catholics taking on the invitation to be who we're called to be. And which, let's face it, other churches have been for many years, light years ahead of us. Not because we don't have the experience of faith and the call to do it, but because we haven't placed the emphasis on it that perhaps we could and should. Um, and perhaps we've done other things that might be a little bit too negative, but, but, but I think it, it's obvious that we're being called to live out this aspect of our faith uh, with more strength. So the question then, and, and this is a theological kind of issue, but, but for me, um, I'm, I'm not going to get too, too theoretical about it, but I think it's really important to understand the why. Why is it so important that we say words about Jesus? Like why? Why does God use the word? And it's because of this word sacramentality. What sacramentality means. Now, again, for some of us, that might sound familiar and we're aware of the sacraments, we're familiar with sacraments. That's part of our Catholic life. But sacramentality is like, the, it, it's a bit of a step more at depth. It's the ground that enables sacraments to work, if that makes sense. So some people have called sacramentality as the key Catholic principle in Christian faith. Um, because, because it's really about, um, actually, I'm going to go forward when I'll come back to this. It's really about how God makes God self-present in the world. So one of, um, uh, Richard McBrien is one of the persons who describes this. He says, no theological principle or focus is more characteristic of Catholicism, more central to its identity than the principle of sacramentality. And there's a few like that. What we're trying to name here is that God is present to humanity in and through the ordinary. We have a faith that believes that humanity, that creation is charged with the grace of God. We believe that it is good, it is well made, and that God has not abandoned creation, if that makes sense. If any of us here have Ignatian spirituality, uh, we would recognize this. Saint Ignatius Loyola said, find God in all things. You can find God in all things because God is in all things, or at least potentially, because the world is sacramental, because it can hold God. Okay, that's what we call a sacramental principle. And this is a beautiful way that Pope Francis uh, speaks about it in Laudato Si. The universe unfolds in God and fills it complete, completely. There's a call to discover God in all things. I'll let you read that. I don't need to read it all out. But a call to discover God in all things. Contemplation helps us to sense the working of God's grace in our hearts 
and in the encounter with all creatures. That's the principle of sacramentality that, that inhabits all things. It's the reality that God is present. But, but the, 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 the fact about preaching is that the word, human words, are sacramental in a special way. Human words are sacramental in a special way. And the word of God is sacramental in a special way. The word carries something within it. And I'd just like to put up a few readings that express that. It's not me saying that the word of God is full of ways in which it tries to say this. So one of them is this. Isaiah 55, for as the rain and the snow come down to he from heaven to the earth and don't go back without doing what I sent them for, without making the earth sprout fruitfully, so is the word that goes from my mouth, it will not come back to me without accomplishing that which I sent it to. So, so it's that beautiful image, for example, in creation where, where we have, um, uh, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God said, let there be, and there was. The word of God doing what God says. OK, it's sacramental. It holds, it carries what it says. And not only God's word, also the voice of the prophet. Those of you, there's a beautiful reading in, Eze in Ezekiel 37 um, uh, that has Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones. And I love it. It's a beautiful reading, uh, Ezekiel. Read the whole chapter if you want. But the most gorgeous aspect of it is that when God wants to bring these dead bones to life, he doesn't say, watch while I bring the dead bones to life. He says to the prophet, prophesy, open your mouth, tell the bones. And the bones come to life when the prophet prophesies. The word of God carries life because it's someone, John 1, 18. We are all made through the word of God, the verb of God, the logos of God, before the incarnation, before Jesus became human, God was already communication and were made in the image and likeness of that communication. All things came into being through him. And this is one of the, the, the most important readings I'm going to put up. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. The word of God touches us, transforms us, converts us. And here we could go back, each one of us, to, to our experiences of encountering Jesus and what, if it was a homily or it was the word of a friend or it was a reading somebody proclaimed with particular strength, and suddenly we recognize something. That is the sacramentality of the word. And that's why the reading that I had just before, Romans 10, how are they going to believe if nobody announces Christ? Romans 10, 13 to 17, because the word is sacrament. So that's the second part of what I wanted to say. And it, to be honest, this is the most central part of what I wanted to say. The rest of what I'm going to say, if you like, sits on that. And it's an understanding of what preaching is. And this is why I would like to share with you my favorite definition of preaching. It's by um, a Dominican sister called Catherine Hilkirk. She has a beautiful book called Naming Grace. And she says that preaching is this. She says, it's the art of speaking the name of God, neither too soon nor too late. So it's naming who God is for those we are speaking to, neither before they're ready for it, nor too late when they need it. And here we're back in the witness, provoke question marks, and then speak. But if you speak it too soon, it's because you're not listening. It's because it's more about you than the person that you're trying to reach to. So naming grace, neither too soon nor too late. And here is where I would like to go to the two points I was talking about, the importance of listening and the importance of friendship. The role of listening. We have a, I would suggest what I would call a false dichotomy um, um, in preaching. We sometimes set speaking against listening, if you like, or even preaching versus service. So there are those who serve and who do things for the people, and there are those who preach. Whereas um, uh, I would suggest it's a false dichotomy because preaching is a form of dialogue that only works when it's born of listening. It only works when we somehow are saying something into a world that we're listening to and sensing the need of. And that's why it's so important when we talk about evangelizing to think about culture. Evangeline Nsiandi also talks about culture, the need to evangelize culture, the need to recognize the seeds of the word in culture. And that comes from St. Justin from, from the second, third century. 
Um, we need to welcome and listen to what's happening in the people we are called to so that we can speak a word on time, the word that they need to hear. Because God is present in human experience, it's the role of the preacher to listen to that presence and to help people interpret it. And I think there's a few steps to that. God is present. In most people's experience, God often emerges in, in, in the moment of suffering. In some, with some people, it can be in others. But the role of the preacher is this. We help them interpret their experience in light of scripture, in light of Christianity, in light of our own story. So we're listening and speaking into the whole time. Preaching is a dialogue. We need to be attentive to the world that God inhabits. And this leads me to what I'd like to suggest is an underestimated space, the space of friendship. And I really feel strongly about this. Some of us in this room, maybe most of us, I don't know, maybe in spaces of preaching, you may be catechists, you may be leading youth groups, you may be teaching, you may be chaplains, you may be in many spaces in which we are called to teach and you're looking to see how you can do it better and that's wonderful. But I'd also like to suggest that there are many situations in which our interaction with those around us becomes a space in which we can mediate and be sacramental to them with words. And I'd like to, if you don't mind, just share um, an example that changed my understanding of things. So it was quite fundamental for me, and I think it will help situate the tips that I'm going to give at the end. Um, when I was working in Spain, one of the things that I was working with, and I was training um, evangelizers and preachers, and one of them who was a doctor or training to be a doctor asked if we could have a group on ethics and Christianity in the university with his co-students. So we opened this ethics discussion group and they were very clear they wanted it also to be for others, non-Christians. So we, and we had wonderful discussions and we were respectful and careful so that people who were Christians could speak from their faith and others who weren't could speak about ethics. And there was one guy, his name was Alex, um, uh, who was an agnostic, a beautiful future doctor, really asking questions, very human, very keen to be an ethical doctor, wonderful participant the whole time. And we became very good friends. We had this group for about a year and a half. So I'm about a year into the group and I'm praying and I'm thinking, gosh, Alec is such a beautiful man. I would love if he had faith. It's that thing I was talking about at the beginning where faith is good news. We're going to want others, even where we recognize that somehow the spirit is already there. So I wasn't looking at Alex thinking, gosh, this man is going, is, is lost. No, I would have loved to have had some of the values this man had. Loved to have had the integrity. And yet he didn't know Jesus. So at some stage I plucked up my courage and I invited him for a coffee, which we had every now and again. And I said to him, Alec, you know, I value friendship. You know how much I respect you. Um, but I just need to say to you, that you know how much faith gives me, my Christian faith. I need to tell you I'd love that you had it. I understand you might not be in that space, but I want you to know that I'd love you to have it. Do you know what he said to me? He said, and I quote, Maeve, if you'd never said that to me, I would have either doubted our friendship or doubted your faith. And for me, it was, it was such a beautiful experience of how Friendships are an authentic bridge to faith for others and how important it is that we respect the dynamics of friendship. And it was that friendship that led me to know when to speak a word, neither too soon nor too late. I later invited him to an encounter a weekend. And when we went around the room to say why you are there, his was, and again, I quote, well, God told Maeve to invite me. So here I am. <laughs> this is an agnostic <laughs> so, you know, friendship can bridge, can bridge worlds. So I'm not going to read this. I'm going to suggest that the foundation of this understanding of friendship, we find it in Dave Urban. God calls us friends. And that dynamic of mission that we and of speaking the word that we have with others needs to follow this dynamic that is here that I would break down in this way. God chose to reveal, reveal God's self. That's the start of that number, Dave Urban 2. God wanted, chose, opened God's self. It's an invitation. It's not an imposition. God addresses us as friends, never imposes intimacy, friendship, relationship. God will wait until we're ready. 
The aim is sharing of life, eternal life. That's the aim of our preaching. The sacramentality transmits God's life. It does something. It provokes conversion. It provokes if the person is open encounter with God. It reveals who God is and who we are. So what we're trying to do is bring people to the best of themselves, not to make them different. And it's words and life together, because we all know that words aren't empty, that when we speak, it's not just the words that come out, the same words in two people sound different because our lives are in those words. Our lives are in those words. So just a few tips to finish uh, because um, I think my time is up. So, oh, what was this? Oh, this is a beautiful quote uh, from, from Eloy Leclerc about friendship. The Lord sent us to evangelize, but what does it mean? It means to say to someone that you are loved too by God, but not just to say it, but to treat them so that they know that this is the case. So that's also about, about friendship. But some simple tips to finish. One, our life is the starting point, right? Our life is the starting point. So ask yourself the following questions or similar. These were just the ones that came to me. Why? Why am I a Christian? Why am I a Catholic? Is there something over the years that has been an impediment for me and, and why am I still here? So reflect upon your faith, why you're here. And I think as Catholics, it's so important that we do this because, again, I, I, when I was in England and I, and I worked with many churches and people who evangelizing churches and two weeks into Christian faith, um, uh, that people would be preaching and I go into a Catholic church and there's people there with 10, 20, 30, 40 years of richness and faith. And they're more fearful, if you like, of expressing. So this beautiful depth of faith in our lives, we need to reflect upon it and trust it. So trust your experience because what touches us will touch others. Now I'm drawing that from that quote on Hebrews from Hebrews 4.12. It's a double-edged sword. When something touches me and I speak it, it touches you as well. When I speak and I preach to others, if I'm preaching authentically, it converts me as well. It's a double-edged sword in the best possible way. So, so don't say when you think, oh gosh, what have I got to say? Oh, that's no good. If it's good for you, it's good for others. What God gives us for ourselves is useful also for others because we channel, the word is sacramental. What touches me will touch others. Three, and these, so these are really important for me. This has taught me so much. And I've seen people learn. So write your story of coming to faith for your younger self. Go back to the origins. Right? Why you, even if it feels far away, our, our life is short. Write it for your younger self. And then think of someone you want to hear it and write it once again for them. And that's really important. Expressing it for myself gives words to the experience. Thinking of an audience and writing it for them helps me translate it. And it will be different if the audience is my mother, my sister, my class of year 12, or my university students at ACU. It will sound different, even though it's the same experience. That's why first I need to write it for me and then write it for others. Learn it by heart. Now, this, uh, I, have had, um, I have had gentle, I wouldn't say arguments, I'd say classroom discussions about this. I actually really think it is helpful to learn by heart, to walk down the street and know you, you'll say it different when you're talking with someone. It will change. Um, but the fact that you learn it by heart gives you the freedom to know that you know it. You're not going to be nervous if you know you know things by heart. Then you can let go of everything and, and speak freely because it'll come to you in the measure that it has to. Next, pray consciously for those you want to speak or preach to. And when I'm going to speak or preach, I sit down and I write their names and I pray, how do you see them, Lord? How do I see them? Who are they? What are they? So pray about them, asking, and again, these are just suggestions, what are they living? Where are they open to the Spirit? Where might they struggle? Who are these people that I'm being called It'll give me light. It will give us light. It allows the spirit, give us knowledge of what might be helpful because we can't control what, and we can't really know what anyone's living, but we can pray and the spirit will guide us to say what might be needed. Spend time getting to know their culture, their language, their history, music, et cetera. Um, each, each, each culture group, each age group is different. So some attempt to understand 
and and to, to to value and i know different cultures can feel some of them can feel challenging and i think we often i know i often look at the younger generation and think i'm not sure i understand them. i'm sure they won't understand me um uh, but you know love lo- love um wins over all things and genuine attentiveness and desire to learn the culture of the people we're called to will be seen and will be valued spend time with scripture even background spend time with scripture because then the words will come because they mean for you they will mean for others spend time be yourself don't try to preach like anybody else don't try and speak to a friend like anybody else don't try and be yourself it's really important and ask for feedback as you try ask for feedback so that people can help and I think that's my 20 minutes up. So I did have a few questions. Where do I find myself in this ministry? And my favorite lecturer when I studied in Rome at the Gregorian was an American Jesuit. And he finished every class by saying questions, reflections, objections. I loved it. It just opens to what's in the room and the richness that might be in the room. 